Um, okay, so we are looking at week um, one of the uh, 20th century American literature. Um, this is uh, basically looking at the time period. So we are looking at the time period between 1900 and 1919. Uh, one of the most crucial texts at the time was Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Now this is a, a novel, so I'm not having you guys read the whole novel, but I did want you to read chapter nine, which is kind of emblematic of what the novel represents. In this novel, Upton Sinclair was trying to inspire Americans to embrace socialism and uh, see the evils of rampant capitalism. Now, that doesn't mean he was a communist. A lot of people get those two confused. He was a socialist. He believed in uniting workers, and he believed that businessmen were exploiting them. And in some cases, he was very correct. This was a time period where capitalism was rampant, where there were no rules, and um, where, to be honest with you, they were exploited. Um, and he chose the meatpacking industry of Chicago as his place to har harness that uh, imagery. And it was harsh, and his portrayals were very difficult to read. I've given you one of the easier chapters to read as far as what's going on in the book. You, you read about men who lose arms and, and fingers into the sausage making and the process still goes on and the sausage still gets made and served um, just with some human parts. Um, these were often day workers. They would literally um, line up in the parking lot of the the, the meat packing, uh, the sausage company, and and hope they get picked to go to work. And then they would work for 16 hours and get their pay and then hope the next day they'd find work. So there was no kind of uh, continuity to the working. They were often immigrants who didn't understand what any kind of rules were, if there were any rules. So... Um, this book was read by Theodore Roosevelt. Um, Upton Sinclair actually sent him a copy, thinking that Roosevelt would read it and start to really crack down on, on capitalism and embrace socialism. And of course, that's not what happened. Roosevelt read it and decided, oh my goodness, we need the FDA, and created an inspect the Inspection Act and uh, the, the whole administration of the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so, you know, he was really trying to master the Dickens-style novel of the late 1800s, where it was the social narrative. However, he did not succeed, not at least to the way he wanted to. Um, one of the things that you'll see, in, you'll see in the chapter in particular um, is that the, that cleaning up, that, that goal that he achieved, the FDA, was not his goal. His goal was to unionize workers. At the time period, it was a, a call to arms in many industries. We had the Pullman strike, where the Pullman Railroad um, workers not only um, went on strike, but had a violent strike that involved... Uh, interaction with authorities and 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 deaths. Uh, we had the um, uh, tri corner t uh, shirt factory in which women were locked into the factory during the day so they they couldn't go out or leave. And when the factory caught fire, they all died. So at this time period, there were a lot of exploitations of workers. Um, there was no 40-hour work week. Most employees were day laborers, which meant no job security. There were no vacation or sick days. There was no kind of retirement. 
There was no unemployment. There was no unemployment. I mean, there's no overtime. There was no unemployment. There was no minimum wage. Um, and all of those items um, were achieved with the result of union negotiations. Uh, Sinclair felt the most important issue facing America was to embrace unions and socialism. He went a step farther than most Americans were willing to go, but his call for some type of unity was essential for the time people, time period where workers were exploited like never before. Our second piece that I'm asking you to read is The Souls of Black Folks by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and it wasn't an accident um, that he called the book The Soul of Black Folk. Um, and we were told by author uh, Abram Kendi, um, Du Bois wasn't looking for catchy titles. He was reacting to the reality of his times. Um, Kendi continued, racist Americans were making the case that black people did not have souls. And the beings that did not have souls were beasts. Uh, and that's a pretty harsh statement to make. Um, so Du Bois wanted to, wanted to express the humanity of black lives. And he felt that he didn't want to play around with words. He wanted to be very clear that that was his goal. Um, and this is a website, and I'll, I'll, I'll make this link live, which talks about the enduring lyricism of the souls of black folk. It's a beautiful piece by NPR. Uh, each chapter of the soul of black folk begin with a pair of epigraphs, a text from a poem, usually by a white European poet, and then the musical score of the spiritual, which was usually done by an African-American. Uh, the entire book is a search to understand the concept of what we call double consciousness. Du Bois believed that black, um, that black people must have two fields of visions at all times, that they must be conscious of how they view themselves as well as being conscious of how the world views them. Now, the two ch chapters I chose, I thought were interesting. The first is a personal look at a black man whose son dies young. And the second, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean a thing. <laughs> uh, the second is a, a, a biography of an African-American reverend. I'm sorry about that typo. I will fix that. Let me just move my, whoops. Oh, come on. I'm in the way and I'm trying to get it to move. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. So um, the second is a uh, piece about this um, African-American reverend. Sorry about that typo. Uh, du Bois's biographer Manning Marable wrote, few books make history and fewer still become foundational texts for the movements and struggles of an entire people. The soul of black folk occupies this rare position. It helped to create the intellectual argument for the black freedom struggle in the 20th century. Souls justified the pursuit of higher education for Negroes and thus contributed to the rise of the black middle class. And that's really important it helped establish them as an intellectual identity. Um, it also broke from the argument at the time that due to their race, they were poor and uneducated. It was society's problem, not their race. Um, so John um, London's um, To Build a Fire, Jack London's to buy a fire. I don't want to see Jack. I'll fix that too. Um, Jack and John are, are synonymous names at the time. But Jack London's uh, To Build a Fire. Um, 
you may know London from other work, like, um, for example, um, uh, White Fang, and, and he wrote a lot of material that dealt with um, going into the nature and battling nature. Um, and many people, many critics, literary critics at the time, believe this story is a great example of what's called the naturalist movement that portrays man versus nature. Why? I wholeheartedly agree. I also think it's kind of a tragic tale of man's hubris or pridefulness. Our protagonist chose to make this trip when most advised it was too cold. However, he felt his judgment was better. He chose to go along, even though he reminds himself incredibly that he should always have a trail companion. Finally, he even abuses the relationship between himself and the dog. He doesn't build fire when the dog feels it is sensible. He sends the dog ahead to check for thinning ice and he contemplates killing the dog to heat his hands. The result of this hubris, this pridefulness, is his ultimate death. Nature and the cold winds. The dog who sides with nature goes in the end to find more sensible human companionship. So when we brings us to our poets, um, I, I had two, in, two poets in particular I wanted you to look at for this time period. Now, these poets um, continued writing way past the early 1900s, but they were certainly two of the first truly great American poets, internationally great. And in fact, both of them spent most of their time outside of the country. Ezra Pound um, spent most of his life, and certainly most of his um, uh, writing life, in Italy and England. Um, he was uh, very influential. He wasn't necessarily the greatest poet as far as the sound of his poetry, the lyricism of his poetry. But technicality, he, he was technically one of the greatest poets, which of course made him a great critic and uh, uh, someone who could see poetic talent. So he ends up finding people like Robert Frost and William Carlos Williams and pushes other great poets, T.S. Eliot. So he's actually behind some of the greatest poets and authors of the first half of the 20th century. Um, he did fall in love with Italy and ended up spending most of his life there. And that in a way became part of his downfall as well as he became enamored with Mussolini and Mussolini's fascist party as it began to rise and in fact spent uh, the last few years of his life until um, Robert Frost was able to plead um, his, for his release uh, in a sanitarium in the United States because of his connection with Mussolini. Um, and I ask you in the journal, I'm going to pull up my Ezra Pound piece here for you. My, my video will come back. Um, and there's, there's Pound towards the end of his life. Um, but I ask you to pick up a, a couple poems and just check them out. If you go all the way to the bottom of this um, very good biography piece I asked you to read, uh, there are all the poems that, well, some of the most famous poems by him, certainly not all of, of Ezra's poems. Ezra Pound wrote a ton of poems. But choose just one and tell me what you think of it. And I'm not going to pick one for you. I'd like to see you pick one for yourself. And you're welcome to dislike it, but don't just say, I dislike it. Tell me why you don't like it. And uh, we'll, we'll look at one. How about um, Nance Figure? This is actually a print from his book. Um, and this is common for, for uh, Pound. He often starts his poems with this kind of, oh, let me bring it down here, with, with some sort of an epigraph. Dance Figure, 
Dark-eyed, a woman of my dreams. Ivory sandaled, there is none like thee among the dancers, none with swift feet. I have not found thee in the tents, in the broken darkness. I have not found thee in the wellhead among the women with pitchers. Thine arms are as a young sapling under the bark, thy face as a river with lights. White is an almond are thy shoulders, white as an almond are thy shoulders, as new almonds stripped from the husk. They guard thee not with eunuchs, not with bars of copper, gilt tor, uh, tor yeah, turquoise and silver are in the place of thy rest. A brown robe with threads of gold woven in patterns hast thou gathered about thee. O oh, the Thakia tree at the river. As a river among the sledge are thy hands upon me, thy fingers a frosted stream. Thy maidens are white like pebbles, their music about thee. And, uh, finishes off with, there is none like thee among the dancers, none with swift feet. So, uh, that, that's the poem. So, um, pick whatever poem you like, um, and, uh, see what you think about it. Our second poet, which you can, uh, choose if you wish to look at, uh, is T.S. Eliot. Now, along with, with Pound, there's probably no better example of what is the modern American poet. Um, he is certainly one of the uh, grand masters of modernism. Po uh, Eliot, like Pound, is an expatriate who spent most, and yes, they spelled my, my uh, dictation software spelled patriot wrong. Uh, they spelled it like someone who's a patriotic, and I meant patriot like um, who lives in this country or who, who left. Um, and he spent most of his time living in England, not the United States. Uh, the Wasteland is perhaps his, the greatest modernist poem written, um, but non-literary people may recognize Eliot's poetry in the Broadway musical Cats. That whole musical is based on a book of poems, word for word, um, that uh, Eliot wrote for his daughter. So there's Eliot, and we have a bunch of Eliot poems to choose from as well. But we're going to look at um, The Wasteland, which is one of his more uh, well-known pieces. Uh, we're not going to read the whole thing because it is pretty long. Or maybe we'll look at the love song. So um, as you can see, um, being friends with Ezra Pound, he actually dedicates it. And uh, the, first, the first part he calls the burial of the dead. And you'll see some phrases that might recognize. For example, the first line, April is the cruelest month. Breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring pain. Notice how Eliot is mixing these images with a beautiful image and a dead image. Memory, desire, dull, spring. Winter keeps us warm, covering earth with forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Spring, summer surprised us, coming over the Snarbergacy. With a shower of rain, we stopped in the colonnade and went in, on in sunlight into the Hof garden and drink coffee and talked for an hour. Bingar kind Russian, stam us Latin ak Deutsch. And when we were children, Staying at the Archduke's, my cousin, 
He took me out on his sled, and I was frightened. He said, Maria, Maria, hold on tight. And down we went in the mountains. There you are, for, you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. Notice um, our poet uh, narrator is Maria. It's not T.S. Eliot, young girl. So, and a young girl who obviously um, lives in Germany or a near Russia border. What are the roots that clutch? What branch grows out of the stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. Where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. And then we have a phrase in German. You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. Then when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing, looking into the light, heart of light, the silence. So he continues on, and then we have this unreal city. And this is very famous because uh, this is referenced in uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's um, Um, the Great Gatsby. So as you can see, this is a long poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing because my throat will give out. So, um, you know, if you want to look at something like this, there are other T.S. Eliot poems. The, the song of, uh, of um, J. Um, Proof Rock is another one that um, Alfred J. Proofrock is another one that's quite famous. Um, also, uh, the love song of, of J. Alfred Proofrock also referenced in um, uh, uh, The Great Gatsby. And I'm looking to see um, observations, Mr. Uh, Apollonax, um, I believe, I'm not sure, that might be from Cats. Um, I don't know if they have any of the Cats poems in this particular website. Um, but uh, I don't see any of them. Um, but, you know, check it out as well. All right. So that brings us to our section on the Great Migration. So after the Civil War, ex slaves tried to survive in the South, but opportunities quickly dried up. So many began in migration up north which was the largest movement of people in modern history. This journey led to some pretty great, um, a great many artistic advances such as jazz and the blues. It's also the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem was not the only destination of the Great Migration. It also brought talent to Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia, St. Louis as well. The Harlem Renaissance is perhaps one of the greatest artistic endeavors of the African-American community. It also produced most of the greatest black artists for the first half of the 20th century. All forms of literature, music, dance, and art were forever changed by the Harlem Renaissance. 
um, for the greatest stars of that movement included uh, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Paul Robeson, uh, Duke Ellington, Josephine Baker, and of course, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, so I did have for, for you, um, you click on this. Uh, this is just a Wikipedia page about the Harlem Renaissance. And I used Wikipedia not because it's the greatest reference, but what's really nice about Wikipedia and what I want to show you is going down to this area. Here is the C also. So these are other sites that you can look at talking about the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, it's got notes and references. Many of these are actual links. So here's one on Dorothy West, the voice of the Harlem Renaissance. Here's another from Harlem Renaissance. Here's speeches of African-American representatives addressing the Ku Klux Klan bill of 1871. It's the actual work. Um, so, uh, here's some ones on queering, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, um, which there was a lot of, uh, um, sexual exploration. Um, this is some black soldiers, a story about black soldiers, um, Catholic church. Methodist Church, a correspondence of W.B. Du Bois. Uh, so there's some pretty good um, notes here. And then if we continue down, we have some other stuff. These are references. These are other information that's really good sources about the Harlem Renaissance. And then further on, we have even more. Here's another one, the Harlem Renaissance in the American uh, experience, uh, Mosaic, the African-American experience. Here's some um, really good external links. Uh, the Guide to the Harlem Renaissance from the Library of Congress, approaching 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance, virtual Harlem. So here's where Wikipedia is useful, is in this collection of other sources. Remember, Wikipedia is basically at its core an encyclopedia. You're in college, you're a little beyond encyclopedias. But encyclopedias are still good base material. They're just not good source material to reference in a paper. But they're good places to find material, to start your digging at, to get your ideas generated. And uh, I, I like Wikipedia for that reason. I'm not one of the professors out there that, that really banned it. I have no problem with using it. I don't want you to use it as your main source in a research paper, but it's a great place to start your research. And we'll, we'll go into that more as we get closer to your first paper. All right. I hope you enjoyed this week's readings. This is basically what your readings will look like each week. Um, I usually try to give you a couple of, uh, you also have a reading from your book. I uh, don't ask you to read any of the short stories in your book, just your chapter on this time period, the, the background information. Um, so I want you to um, try to continue, keep up with your reading. You will have a discussion question with the discussion questions are basically um, you respond with the original comment and then comment on a class base and you get your full 10 points. You only do one of those items, you get five points. Then you have your journal, uh, which is on there usually prompted. That's worth 20 points. My grading on that one is it must be 150 words. It must be at least two paragraphs, and it must be about the subject. That's it. I'm not real strict. Um, then, um, you know, we'll have three papers throughout the semester, which will be kind of uh, offshooting from your journals. So your journals kind of give you some ways to start thinking of how you want to approach 
your paper. Then there's also going to be a very, oops, I'm losing my picture here. There's also going to be a very short quiz, which is multiple choice. So just to make sure you, you comprehended the readings. All right. So have a good week. Sorry about that. Have a good week.